Welcome, this is Ike Hoffman with Tactica Real Estate Solutions, and today I wanna to talk about cap rates. Cap rates may be the most common expression across multifamily investment and really all of commercial real estate. The irony is cap rates are pretty much meaningless without a ton of additional context. Somebody telling me that they purchased a property for a six cap is the equivalent of a golfer telling me they scored a five on hole 18, but not telling me what the par of the hole is. How am I supposed to know if that's good? I need to know many other factors to assess whether that was an impressive feat or not. If it was a par five on a windy rainy day, I'd say that's a job well done. If it was a five on a hundred yard par three, not so much. Cap rates are the same. They mean very little until we can substantiate them. Today, I plan to walk you through my rationale of justifying cap rates and hopefully showing you some tips on determining whether or not a cap rate is good or bad. If you've been enjoying Tactica's real estate videos, I'd really appreciate it if you'd like the video, subscribe to our channel, and allow us to notify you when we're releasing new video content. Let's go ahead and begin. When you're doing a cap rate analysis, I think there's five crucial steps. The first is understanding at a very high level the market values in cap rate terms in the city you're interested in investing. You can do this via a cap rate survey and I'll show you how later in the video. The second thing is once you have that high level understanding of what class A properties are selling for, or class C properties in your particular city, then you need to refine those reasonable cap rate ranges with sales comps. So ideally you'll be able to see the actual sales and some cap rate data on the asset class that you're interested in that have taken place over the past year. The third step then is adjusting the historical financials to smooth out any financial anomalies and account for an increased property tax liability. Step four would be assessing deferred capital. One question I always ask myself is if a property, let's say has a $500,000 NOI and it's selling for $10 million, is it really a five cap if it needs $2 million in deferred capital? I'd argue no. If there's a property that has a significant amount of deferred maintenance, the cap rate should be higher to account for the fact that you or your investors need to put significantly more capital into the deal to take care of some of these maintenance issues. So for properties that have a lot of deferred maintenance, it may be better to do more of a stabilized return on cost calculation and then comparing that return on cost to the market cap rates to make sure you're getting a good deal. And then the final step, step five, would be once you have all this information, you know high level what's happening in the market, you've seen sales comps, you're looking at the financials of your property and smoothing over any anomalies, you understand what the property tax liability is gonna be, you then need to reevaluate that cap rate to determine if it's higher, which would be good, or lower, which would be bad, than what should be reasonably expected in the marketplace. So let's set up a scenario. We're looking at a class A property in Minneapolis, Minnesota that was built in 2017. We've received some basic financials and pricing guidance from the broker, and we want to determine if from a cap rate perspective, it's a good deal. So let's start with a cap rate survey. Most big brokerage shops publish cap rate surveys either quarterly or biannually. Specifically, I'll be looking at CBRE's 2023 first half report. As I mentioned earlier, this is gonna offer us a great high level view of what a reasonable cap rate range should be in cities around the US and Canada for various different asset classes. How did I find these? I just Googled them. I literally typed in CBRE 2023 cap rate survey. And I also went back a little further and I'm going to pull the 2021 cap rate survey as well. Remember, these are coming from brokers that are active on the front lines of property transactions and they're sharing these data points and what they've been seeing, which is all then compiled to create these cap rate ranges for the various asset classes. While the cap rate range today is undoubtedly the most important, I also want to go a little further back so I can gauge how cap rates have been trending over the years. As I record this video, it's a safe bet that cap rates have been expanding in your city and we really want to see to what extent. Markets are going to vary in how they've been reacting to this rising interest rate environment. So let's go ahead and look at the CBRE's 2023 H1 cap rate report and we're focused on a class A property in Minneapolis. So we wanna look at what those Minneapolis cap range ranges are. So I'm in the multifamily infill section. Over on the right, we have the Midwest, and you can see as of half one, 2023, um, class A stabilized is selling for five and a half to five and a half. So there's not even a range. 
um, the brokers are reporting a 5.5% cap rate. What's nice is they also compare that to half two of 2022. We can see it used to be 5% to five and a quarter. So since the second half of 2022, cap rates have expanded by 25 basis points. Eventually I'm gonna compile this data to see if there's any kind of trend. And then I wanna scoot over to the 2021 cap rate survey. Again, I just Googled this. I just typed in CBRE 221 a cap rate survey and it, it showed up as one of the first search results. And so I'm already in the, the multifamily class A infill for the Midwest section and back in 2021, kind of the peak of COVID stimulus, the cap rate range was four and a quarter to four and a half. This report also includes the second half of 2019. So we can even get data going back a little further when the class A stabilized rent cap range was four and a half to four and three quarters. So now I wanna compile this. The ranges make that a little tricky. So I'm just going to take the dead center of the, each range and, and put in the cap rate, kind of that average cap rate for these different time periods into Excel. So we had four different dates we can plug in. We had December of 2019, we had June of 2021, we had December of 2022, and June 2023. And if we take the middle point of those cap rate ranges, we had 4.625%, 4.375%, 4.375%, 4.375%, 4.375%, 5 and then the most recent was 5.5%. I'm just going to highlight this data and make a simple line chart. Tighten up the vertical axis a little bit, set the minimum to 4%. Back before COVID, Class A was, was kind of around a 4-6 cap. The COVID happened, there was a lot of stimulus, a lot of investment demand, people were afraid of inflation, and the cap rate got as low as 4.375% in Minneapolis. The Fed started talking about increasing rates, tightening up their balance sheet, and it's been cap rate expansion ever since. In the last few years, it's been a steep ascent. So what this data tells me is, yeah, cap rates have been expanding and, and they're probably going to continue to do so unless the Fed starts cutting. Fed Chair Jerome Powell has maintained a hawkish tone. So at this point, you know, I, don't, I think a five and a half cap is kind of the low end of what I would deem as reasonable for a class A asset in Minneapolis. I'm expecting things to continually expand over the next couple quarters. So I think ideally, if there was a if there was a property that was listed or I was talking to an owner that was was selling a deal, you'd really want the true cap rate to be maybe somewhere between five six, five seven five. Give yourself a little bit of a buffer to what the the current cap rate survey is saying. Anything below five point five, I don't I won't see that as a good deal. The next step will be to verify that with some sales comps that have taken place. You could get surveys from all of these different groups for a more robust and vetted baseline of what a reasonable cap rate range should be. Now let's look at the sales comps. We have a list of five sales comps that have taken place in 2023. Um, these are imaginary, so if you're familiar with the Minneapolis market, there's no need to play detective and try to decode the properties. Brokers generally track sales and cap rate intel along with like a subscription service like CoStar. Accuracy is always hard to verify for a, for a multitude of reasons. If you want to learn more about that, I have a blog post linked below talking about why cap rates can be misleading. But there's only five comps here. Uh, I mean, realistically, in the current environment, sales volume has been hard to come by with the, with the rising rates. Transactions aren't as present as they once were just a few years ago. Uh, but just looking at some of these sales, they, they do align fairly well with what we saw in the cap rate survey, kind of kind of the mid 5% range. Uh, except for one anomaly, there is a property D. It's sold for a 4.75 cap. Um, and it's a good lesson. There's a good lesson in here. You always need to do more research on the properties that are listed on these sales reports and ensure they're actually comps of the property you're analyzing, um, like the 4.75% cap. While it's in the same zip code as the subject property, it is extreme luxury and it, it targets 
a more affluent renter pool. So the rents for this project are about 50 cents per square foot higher than the subject property or any of the other comps listed in this report. Ultimately, just not a great comp because it's more expensive, it's, it's catering to a different demographic and the units are much larger. It's probably best just to exclude that, that, that row and you can see that we have an average calculated below that's 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 calculating the average cap rate and the average price per unit of these comps. And once we delete that one out, it shoots up to a 5.48%. Like we saw in the cap rate survey, I think this helps kind of confirm what my initial thoughts were is the cap rate of whatever class A property we're analyzing in Minneapolis, it needs to be greater than a five and a half to be considered good and considered better than what's happening in the current marketplace. And there's always that disclaimer, right? Like a 5.6 to a 5.75 cap might seem great today, but when we come back, if let's say you were to purchase the project at a 5.65 cap, you could come back in 12 or 18 months and now the market cap rates at six. And what was a good deal in, in the present day terms may be a bad deal in the future. So this, these things are always changing, they're always moving. That's why we went back and got some more surveys because we just wanna make sure we understand how the market's been moving and hopefully that five, six to five and three quarter cap builds in a little bit of buffer. After looking at the cap rate surveys and looking at some sales comp data, we have a very good feel of what the market cap rate is for class A property in Minneapolis. So now what we need to do is look at the financials that we've received from the broker or from the seller directly and see how their numbers in tandem with a suggested purchase price would compare to this market intel we've been analyzing. So let's go ahead and look at the trailing three, trailing 12 financials. This class A property we're interested in, it has a pricing guidance of 30.5 million. It's 120 units, so that, that brings the price, the pricing guidance per unit to 254,000. We have T3, T12 financials. If you're not familiar with that terminology, the, the T3 revenue is simply just the last three months of revenue and you multiply it by four. So you annualize it and it's more of a recent revenue trend and this tends to be fairly industry standard to look at the revenue in this light. The expenses, it's just the last 12 month of expenses. You don't do any trending there um, because a lot of expenses tend to be seasonal. If you wanna learn more about the T3, T12, I have a very, in-depth blog post that I'll link below. You can learn about why it's advantageous to receive financials in this format. When we look at the financials, it's very high level and that, that $30.5 million pricing guidance. If we take that $1.7 million NOI divided by the pricing guidance, we get a cap rate of 5.6%. And that seems pretty solid when, when we were kind of hoping that we could find a deal that would fall within that 5.6 to 5.7% range. However, there's some things we need to smooth over in these numbers. This property was recently in lease up. So the, the current ownership group has been working incredibly hard on filling these units and it only stabilized recently. It only got to above 90% occupancy within the last six months or so. So a lot of these historical expenses are more reflective of the lease up and not how the property is gonna operate with 90% plus occupancy. So we need to make some alterations here. I have a few columns ready to do this. Let's just go line by line and, and make some adjustments if we feel like we need them. So the potential rent, the current rent roll, the average rent is $1,800. So I'm gonna give them full credit for what they're currently achieving as their actual in place leased rents. That adds out to about 2.6 million. So it's about $19,000 higher than what their, their trailing three financials say. I'm gonna take their parking, this is kind of their, their potential parking rent and their potential other income, things like pet, storage, miscellaneous fees, revenue items of that nature, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take those at par. We're not gonna make any adjustments. And then for vacancy, I'm gonna run a 9% vacancy on all of these potential revenue items. That's with my most recent research I did in, in, in the urban Minneapolis market, 9% feels like a, a reasonable estimate. And, and currently at the property vacancy is like 8.8%. So it's pretty much what, what's going on anyways at the property. It's not much of an adjustment at all. So I'm gonna take equals 0 0.09 times, then we'll do a negative sum of everything above. And we get negative 262,000. So from a total revenue standpoint, I'm adding about $13,000 on onto what what their historical financials were. So technically I'm giving them 
a little bit of credit. I'll go ahead and I'll just do a quick per unit calculation as well. That can be helpful. And then I'll use the format painter just to make sure it looks consistent. So let's go to admin. So admin um, in the T12 financials, the expenses were about 30,000. I'm gonna go ahead and enroll with that number. That feels pretty accurate for what the property will operate at when it's stabilized. But marketing seems expensive. So in their T12 financials, they had almost $100,000 in marketing. That's about 807 per unit. I'm confident that this property stabilized. Now a lot of that expense was just getting that initial lease up done and taken care of. So I think we would be fair to adjust this down a little bit and going forward, we're not gonna be paying $800 per unit. Let's say it's gonna be more around 300 per unit. So we'll do 300 times 120 units. So that's $36,000 per year. Management fee, I think historically they've been running about 4% of total revenue. I'll, I'll use the same amount and that adds out to 106,000. I think their their payroll is a little understaffed. I think they've been able to run a little bit leaner, maybe when all the units weren't full. So I wanna play it safe and I'm gonna put in 216,000, which is about 1,800 per unit. And I think that for 120 units, class A property would be sufficient to cover all of the employee overhead. So that's that's leasing, management, maintenance, and, and the load. So those are payroll taxes and, and any retirement benefits, those types of things. For utilities, again, I think utilities is a tad overstated. So this is a utilities net, uh, meaning this is the difference between what the property pays and, and gross utilities and what they can bill back. But remember when the property is in lease up, there's a lot of vacant units. The ownership would have had to pay the electricity and the gas bills for these vacant units when once the units are occupied, they would pay directly to the provider. So I think this will get a little bit skinnier now that the property is stabilized. I'll sell for 200. That's kind of the exposure that we would potentially have as the new ownership group uh, with, with vacancies and, and you know not being able to bill back for some of the common areas, those things. I think for a class A property, both the contract services and repairs and maintenance is fair estimate, but insurance is definitely gonna be more expensive. We'll say we got a bid for $57,000. And then property taxes is the big one. Property taxes are not yet stabilized in these historical financials. You can see they, they had paid over the past year about $306,000, which adds out to 2,500 per unit. I know that the comps for this type of class A property in this part of the city tend to be between 4,000 and 4,200 per unit. So I'm gonna run property taxes at 4,100 per unit, which is 492,000. And I also run, want to run 200 per unit times 120 units in just a reserve contingency. So the expense ratio, once we've made these adjustments, jumps from 35.3% to 41.5. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do, I'm gonna copy and paste the per unit over. Now our adjustments are complete. The cap rate goes from a 5.6 to a 5.09%. Now when we're looking at this property with this adjusted lens, we're really not getting a, a great deal. The true cap rate is closer to a 5.1 and that 5.6 really isn't realistic unless we're confident we could we could boost revenue significantly or, or maybe property taxes stabilize at a lot less than 4,100. But again, the comps are there to back that, that, that almost $500,000 number we plugged in. So really this is at this pricing point, it's a 5-1 cap, not a 5-6. The last thing I wanna do is plug these numbers into Tacticus back of the envelope template. That's linked below if you need just kind of like a free one page Excel to quickly analyze deals. That's what this tool does and it'll, it'll hopefully offer up some more insights and kind of show you some of the flaws with this particular project. Okay, so pricing guidance was, was 30.5 million. We'll plug in some generic debt terms. We'll just do a 60% LTV, uh, a 6% interest rate, amortization will be 30 years, and then a 1% loan cost. This project was 120 units, and the rentable square footage will say 86,000 square feet. There's no, there's no serious capex. This is a class A property. It's new, uh, but we will put in just, just a, a little bit of a buffer for stuff that could go wrong. We'll do $1,000 a unit or $120,000.
and then we can move into our operating assumptions. If you recall, we were solving for $1,800 per unit as kind of that gross potential rent amount. Uh, parking, let's, we're solving for $125 per parking space. Other income around $100 per unit. And then we are running a 9% vacancy, which is in line with what other Class A comps are running in the Minneapolis submarket. And so we have the total revenue of about $2.65 million. And then we'll move on to expenses admin. We're solving for about 250 per unit. Marketing, 300 per unit at stabilization. We're doing a 4% management fee. The payroll was about 1,800 per unit or 216,000. Utilities net, so what ownership would be responsible for, 200 per unit. And then contract services, 450. R&M, 500 per unit. Insurance, 475 per unit. And then we are running a $200 per unit reserve. And then property taxes is the next section. So currently property taxes are only assessed at 15.6 million. The annual, annual taxes due today, I wanna note that's a little different than what was in the T12 historicals. Sometimes that happens depending on if they're doing cash accounting or accrual accounting or just, or the timing, if there's multiple tax payments paid throughout the year. Um, but that may be worth a question to ownership is why why it's 305, 670 when we can see that um, the payable due on the county website is about 250,000. Um, but it, it really doesn't matter because when we're doing our cap rate analysis, we want to figure out that fully stabilized amount anyways. And we're going to assume this reassesses at 100% of the potential sales price of 30.5 million. So that adds out to property taxes of a, about $4,100 per unit, which is kind of where we expected them to fall, judging by the comps of newer product in the submarket. So now when we come down, there's one more input we need to make. What is the market cap rate of this particular product type in Minneapolis? We determined it was 5.5%, and now our analysis is complete. So what's going on here? Well, really, we're paying a 5.11% cap when we plug in kind of the true stabilized operating expenses. And if we were to sell this back to the market out of 5.5 cap, our profit potential is negative. We'd be paying more than what it's worth. So the next step would be, well, what does it need to be? What does the price need to be to be fair? And we remember we determined that kind of 5.6 to 5.75% would be a reasonable cap rate on vetted financials. So we can do a quick goal seek exercise. Goal seek, and we wanna set the cap rate to 5.6% by changing the purchase price. To get to a 5.63% cap rate, we need to pay about $28 million, which is about a $2.2 million haircut from the current pricing guidance. The other thing I wanna point out in this model is, is this is a new deal, so there's no deferred capital. If there was you know, roofs or exteriors or other major CapEx items that needed to be taken care of, I'd be much more focused on the unlevered yield on cost below the cap rate, right? Because that's going to factor in all of those capital costs while the cap rate doesn't. The cap rate just takes the NOI divided by the purchase price, where the yield on cost will take the NOI divided by the purchase price plus any CapEx you'd be paying out of pocket. So the yield on cost metric might be the preferred metric to compare to the sales comps and to those cap rate surveys if you're purchasing maybe a class B or class C property that has a ton of deferred maintenance. So that concludes the video. We went through the five crucial steps I think are necessary when you're doing a cap rate analysis. First, you need to understand the high level market values and cap rate terms. So what's happening in your city? What are properties selling at? And you find this out by looking at the cap rate surveys. I specifically looked at some data from CBRE, but all major brokerages also publish similar surveys every quarter or biannually. Once we have kind of the high level understanding of what these cap rate ranges are for the various asset classes in a market, then we need to refine that reasonable cap rate range by looking at the sales comps. So ideally you're getting these from, from the local brokerage teams or you have a subscription to CoStar and you're making sure that they fall in line with what you're seeing in surveys. You're vetting each one of those sales comps, making sure that it, it is truly comparable to your subject property and you're kind of re-evaluating what that reasonable cap rate range is. 
After that, you can look at the historical financials of the property you're analyzing. You need to smooth over any anomalies, especially with the future property tax liability. The next step, if you have an older property, you would also need to look at the deferred capital. And you might wanna alter that cap rate formula to be more of a stabilized yield on cost where you're comparing that yield on cost to the cap rate intel you found in the sales comp report and also those cap rate surveys. And then finally, once you have all this information, you've done all this research, you need to reevaluate the cap rate to determine if it's higher, which would be good, or lower, which would be bad, than what should be reasonably expected in the marketplace. Thank you so much for watching the video today. If you've been enjoying Tactica's real estate analysis content, I'd really appreciate it if you liked the video, subscribe to our channel, and allowed us to notify you when we're releasing new video content. I appreciate your time and attention, and we'll see you next time. Take care.